ancestors of the American saddlebred carried our soldiers to victory throughout the early years of this nation. Their contribution to both the settlement and the protection of this country is a matter of history. The predecessor to today's American saddlebred was a breed called the American Horse and had a long history of service to this country. The American Horse was the result of a combination of several different breeds, including the Thoroughbred, the Arab, the Galloway, and Hobby Horses. Also important to the development of the American Horse was the Narragansett Pacer. The American Horse was introduced to war early in the history of this country. They were cavalry horses during the Revolutionary War and carried American freedom fighters during the decisive battle against Britain at Kings Mountain in South Carolina. The American horse was as much a pioneer as the people they carried into the frontier. Daniel Boone rode American horses as he crossed the Cumberland Gap and made his way into Kentucky. When the war between America and the British broke out in 1812, the American horse again went to war carrying Kentuckians in battle from Michigan to Illinois. Following the war, the desire for good quality saddle horses inspired breeders in Kentucky to establish the breed we know today as the American Saddlebred from the American Horse Stock. The Stallion Denmark, who has been designated as the foundation sire for the breed, was foaled in 1839. But it was during the Civil War that this breed gained notoriety as the mount for famous generals. General Lee rode Traveler and General Grant rode Cincinnati, both American saddle horses. These horses endured the hardship of long years of battle as Americans fought Americans and a nation was nearly torn apart. General Grant ordered that the surrendering Confederate Army be allowed to keep their horses, which were all privately owned. This act may have well saved the American saddlebred from extinction. After the war, this beautiful gated horse flourished and soon became a favorite in the relatively new sport of breeding horses for the show ring. The American Saddlebred is unmistakable. This horse has been described as having presence, class, style, and even charm. Whatever the adjective you choose, once you have seen an American Saddlebred running in a field or performing in a show, you will never forget it. Along with this breed's unique attitude come very distinguishable physical characteristics. The head is finely chiseled and is carried alertly with a straight face line. It is lean in proportion to the rest of the body. The neck is long, arched, and well flexed at the pole. The shoulder should be long, sloping, flat, and smooth. The back is level with the tail coming out high. The beauty and elegant carriage of the American Saddlebred have made them popular features in such movies as Gone with the Wind and Black Beauty. The action of the Saddlebred is graceful and comes naturally to the breed. They compete at five distinguished gates and are also known for their excellence as a driving horse. Famous for the show ring, they are slowly making inroads into the dressage world. The American Saddlebred has served Americans for over 200 years in both battle and as a utility horse. Their legacy of service and beauty truly qualifies them for the title, The Horse America Made. Jeff Bumgardner owns and operates Hope Ranch in Somerset, Kentucky. He has a long history of showing and breeding the American Saddlebred. He talked with us about this high-stepping, beautiful breed. I've been involved with the American Saddlebred since I was probably about seven years old, so that would be about 30 years now. And I um, started showing the American Saddlebred when I was a teenager for a breeding farm nearby. And I showed my first Saddlebred when I was probably 11 years old. Never been on a Saddlebred in my entire life, I'd, not as a show horse, yeah. just Saddlebreds trail riding and things like that. And, and the first Saddlebred that I ever showed the trainers stood on each side of the ring and told the horse what to do and I just sat there. The horse was very well trained and uh, just fell in love from that moment on and my dream for years has been to become a breeder and a trainer of the American Saddlebred Horses and we got back into the breeding aspect of the Saddlebreds when I had children of my own and they have fallen in love with them. I've been riding horses for about eight years by myself. How about you Erin? I've been on horses for about a month and a half. 
Um, I'm seven years old. I've been riding horses for about three years. I would uh, recommend being involved with horses to other young people because a horse can be just as good of a friend as a person can be. American Saddlebred is a very proud horse. It, it travels with very distinct, elegant motion. It has a lot of animation, very high trot, and just sets up and, and travels with a very nice look. More, more sophisticated and elegant than some of the other breeds. American Saddlebred has five gates, three of those gates which are natural gates that they're born with, the walk, the trot, and the canter. The American Saddlebred has two, two additional gates, the slow gate, which is a very smooth gate. You could sit on the American Saddlebred with the, with the slow gate and hold a cup of water and probably not spill any of the water, it's so smooth. And then just a, a faster version of the slow gate would be the rack, and that makes up the five gates of the American Saddlebred. Hope Ranch is an abbreviation for helping others prepare for eternity, looking to the future for young people in their lives. And I think that the American Saddlebred horse, and any horse for that matter, is something that you can use with young people to keep their mind occupied. Horses are sort of addicting, and you, you get to working with them, and you fall in love with them, and then you, your desire is just to make them better. And we have plans to, to start a ranch for teenagers, that maybe have some kind of, of attention problem or something like that to try to channel their energy into something because it's so exciting and so overwhelming for the child when, when they actually see the progress that they can make and it helps them to realize, hey, I can do something. And I think the horse is very, very good to do that because you become attached to your horse and your horse and you become one when you're showing. And that's our goal with young people is to try to use the horse to help them to realize that that there's something better in life than, than the things that they're, they're being offered by the world today. An American Saddlebred owner needs to be someone that is somewhat experienced with horses. The American Saddlebred has a characteristic of being very high strung, but they're very smart and, and intelligent animals as well. They, uh, they can be taught well, but they also are smart enough that if they have a totally inexperienced handler, that they will take advantage of them at times. But uh, once a saddlebred is trained and it, it grows older in age and becomes a little calmer, then they, they are good for beginners and they're used lots of times in lessons and, and lesson programs like that. But for someone that just knows nothing about the horse at all, the American saddlebred would probably not be the ideal horse for them to have for the first horse, but maybe for them to look forward to having later on as they become more experienced. When it comes to mares delivering healthy foals, there are no guarantees. Even after a successful pregnancy and delivery, problems can occur. Dr. Johnson talks about how you can help your newborn foal in those first hours after delivery. The first thing that you want to do if you see your mare going into labor is you want to leave her alone. Uh, mares are very sensitive to people being around when they're trying to have their babies and sometimes they'll even hold their labor in order to uh, wait until you're gone or until you're asleep. So uh, you can keep, watch her from afar and if she needs help then you can jump in. But otherwise don't agitate her, don't bother her, make her more nervous. Immediately after the birth the first thing that you want to check is to make sure that mama has passed her placenta. You want to make sure that all the afterbirth is there and that she's passed all of it. If a placenta is retained greater than three hours, it's what's called a retained placenta. And then we can get into problems. Uh, sometimes it can cause colic. Sometimes toxemia can set up after a short period of time. Sometimes founder can result later on. So if you see that the mare has retained her placenta, call your vet right away. You want to get something done for that right away. Another important thing to do is to let mama have some time with the baby. You want to get bonding time between the mare and the foal. You want to uh, let him go ahead and suckle, make sure that he does. Uh, you want to let her nuzzle him, get used to him, and let him go ahead and dry off. Then after that, if you want to, you can do what's called imprinting. Uh, that's where you go in and you touch him all the way from his nose to his tail and let him know that humans are not uh, to be afraid of. And they say that that will help them throughout their entire lives as far as interaction with humans. Of course you want to call your veterinarian. If there are problems early in the labor, you want to call him right then. 
but if there are no problems and you have a normal healthy birth, then after everything's all finished up and everybody's up and dry and, and happy, then we want to go ahead and call the veterinarian in, let him do a check of the baby and a check of mama. We're going to go ahead and check the mare, make sure that she has plenty of milk. We're going to give her a tetanus shot. We're going to make sure that that placenta is gone. We're also going to check that baby. We're going to check his heart rate, his respiratory rate. We're going to give him a tetanus shot. We're going to dip his navel with some iodine solution. We're also going to give him an enema in order to help him pass that first meconium and avoid any impaction that might result later. Because of the placenta in the mare, the foal doesn't get any immunoglobulins before birth. So he's 100% dependent upon the colostrum in order to get his immunoglobulins. So if the mare is not providing enough milk from the start, the first thing that you want to do is make sure that he gets some colostrum. In the first 24 hours, he needs the oral colostrum. If she doesn't have enough, then you might want to find it from other sources, because it's really important that he has it. We want to give him about 20 milliliters per kilogram in that first 24 hours. If we have what we call a failure of passive transfer, then he doesn't get the colostrum he needs in that first 24 hours, then the only other way to get those immunoglobulins into his system and build up his immunity is through IV plasma from another horse. We also have a lot more options today to help the mare produce more milk. We didn't have those options a few years ago and there are a few things in experimentation right now that we can try that work very well in order to help stimulate some milk production in her. If we can't, if she doesn't develop any milk production, then we'll have to bottle raise that baby. And there are different products on the market, uh, powdered milk replacers that you can get at feed supply stores and other, other sources. And there's also the option of using goat milk. Now goat milk is an excellent product, uh, replacer for mare's milk. In about the first 12 hours after the birth, we get what's called a grace period. And that baby's gonna feel fine and he's gonna move around a lot and be very active. If we've had a problem, and our foal is starting to get sick, the first things that we'll see are depression and lethargy. Those will develop within about 12 to 24 hours after that baby's born. And those are the first signs that you'll look for. The most important thing that a horse owner can do to increase his chances of having a healthy foal is to work in concordance with his veterinarian right from the very beginning, from the first palpations, all the way up until the baby is born and then treatment of the baby after he's born. If we work with teamwork, we'll have a lot better chance of getting a healthy baby on the ground. Sometimes, no matter how careful you are as an owner or how much quality health care you give your pregnant mare, tragedy strikes. A mare dies shortly after giving birth. What do you do with an orphan foal? Suzanne Jernigan found herself in just that position. Uh, Lucky's mother died um, after a difficult delivery seven hours after he was born and the veterinarian thought that perhaps she had had a bleed in the uterus and, and just bled internally. Uh, we didn't, there weren't any signs outward that there was anything really wrong other than she was exhausted. Normally uh, we've never lost a mare, normally everything goes fine, occasionally you lose a foal that's presented in the wrong position and that we've lost some that way. Um, but uh, we usually watch our mares very closely and um, uh, we usually, they do everything themselves pretty well. This is the first time I've raised an orphan foal. I've raised some orphan calves and uh, it's uh, been very tiring. The, the first couple of weeks we fed him every three hours and we did that at night too. So it really wore us down and uh, after two weeks we said enough is enough. And <laughs> We decided to uh, let him go five hours at night and we did that for about a week and now he's going eight hours at night. And I come up here in the morning and he's sleeping so I know he's okay. Um, it's just getting the right amount of milk down him and not overdoing it. I bottle fed him for one day and on the second day we trained him to, to a bucket. We just um, used our finger to get his mouth down in the bucket, he let him suck our finger and led him to the milk and he learned it very easily. We've tried not to overhandle our orphan foal so he won't become aggressive because um, he really he thinks we're his mother and um, he wants to play with us and he gets a little rough so 
uh, we, the only handling we do with him is to feed him and uh, we, we put a halter on him, we have halter broken him and, and take him outside and lead him and put him in, in a round pen to play and that's all the handling we do. I imprinted him uh, right after he was born. Uh, of course I didn't know there was anything wrong with the mare at that time so he has been imprinted. I'm not an expert on imprinting, but um, mainly what I do is just rub them all over their ears, their heads, their feet, just rub their whole body uh, continuously uh, for about 20 minutes and then you let him rest and then uh, when he's awake again you do it some more. Uh, some people take um, clippers in there and get them used to the sound of clippers and um, tap on their feet and that, to get them used to shoeing and that type of thing. But mainly what we do is just a lot of petting. He's, he's very um, friendly, he's not afraid of us. We have almost forgotten how strange a thing it is that so huge and powerful and intelligent an animal as a horse should allow another and far more feeble animal to ride upon its back. Peter Gray. The old saying, no feet, no horse, is a reality. Johnny Warner creates handcrafted footwear from steel, fire, and anvil. He talked with us about the importance of maintaining your horse's feet. Johnny Warner works his craft in the foothills of East Tennessee. He is both a certified and a registered journeyman farrier. Why is it so important to have a professional farrier take care of your horse's feet? The biggest reason is a horse without a foot is no horse. Secondly, you gotta look at is professional farriers know what they're doing. They have a very unique understanding of the anatomy and physiology of the horse's foot, what it should, should look like, how it functions, and how to maintain the natural function of that foot so that you don't have problems down the road. Is it absolutely necessary for a horse to be shooed? It depends on the amount of work, type of work, and the location of where they're working. Horses that are in Florida and on the uh, North Carolina coast where it's all sandy ground just need the feet trimmed to keep a good maintenance on them. Whereas horses up in the Tennessee mountains and the plateau and all with a lot of rocks have to be shod in order to work because the hoof growth on the horse's foot wears for that horse's weight. And when you put him to work with pushing a collar or adding 200 pounds on his back with a horse and a rider, it breaks down quicker than what it's actually growing and then it gets into sensitive structures and the horse goes lame. Depending on the type of work you want, some horses you shoot for no traction and all protection. Some horses you shoot for protection and traction on their feet. Or we use rim shoes and heels to give them traction on dirt. We use borium and studs to give them traction on rocks and pavement depending on the type of work they're doing and where horses are just being ridden in an arena, they don't need any traction at all. The foot takes care of it. What are some of the, the emergency problems that you're called to deal with from, from horse owners? The biggest ones I run into are probably abscesses, where a horse has stepped on a nail and punctured his foot and set up an infection inside the hoof capsule. And these horses are usually three-legged lame. They can't put the foot on the ground at all. By draining the abscess and medicating it, we get the horse back into work pretty quick. And the other one's founders. And the lows have to be worked mainly with the assistance of a veterinarian because there's parts of it that he can do with drugs to help the horse and the stuff that I can do to support the horse. On the foals, they need proper maintenance and trimming on them so that you have a good so that you don't get uh, anger, deformities in their legs, and usually anywhere from two to four weeks they should st be put on a trimming rotation. As far as shoes, it's when the horse starts it to really work where he needs the protection up, and then, but if he doesn't need the protection, he doesn't need the shoes. The problem with the pastures are being with the foal not being touched out on the pasture is that uh, horses are were originally a wild animal that ran all across the ground and they ran in the rocks and they ran on the soft ground and they wear their feet off. And we got them in the soft pastures that we got nowadays, their hooves grow and they're not wearing off. So you have to go back and trim to help what nature's not giving them by being confined in the pastures. What does a professional uh, farrier prefer in dealing with horse owners and their horses? Probably the first thing is horses that are caught when we get here, they stand quietly. 
They don't get upset too easily. They're used to having their feet handled. The owners are there, so if there's any problems arise that they can take care of it. And we don't get bit by the horse, <laughs> which happens every now and then. The biggest thing to do is clean their feet out. And by picking their feet up and cleaning it out, they're also stopping uh, the possibility of thrush getting in their feet because it's an anaerobic bacterial infection that sets up in an environment where there's no moisture, whether it's warm, wet, and uh, no oxygen. And by cleaning the horse's feet out, you allow oxygen to get in and kill out this bacteria. I understand there's also a fungus that's kind of re uh, appeared in the last few years that you have had, having, been having to deal with. What is the name? Uh, that uh, white line disease is what we're seeing a lot now. A lot of horses coming up from Florida have it. A lot of them here in Tennessee have this. And uh, it eats away at the lamina, which connects the hoof wall to the bone. I've seen horses with just slight amount of it. I've seen them where I could stick three fingers inside the hoof capsule where it's eating away so bad. And uh, there's a lot of things came out on the market that treat it. The best thing I've found so far is using methylate on them. The horse owners can get it, but it's hard to treat it because it's underneath the shoe because the white line will be covered when the shoe's on the foot. I saw you, you, you shoeing earlier, and I, I saw pieces of metal on the sides of the, of, of the actual shoe. What, what are those for? Those were clips. They help maintain the shoe on the horse's foot. It takes all the stress off of the nails. When the foot hits the ground, the shoe stops before the foot does, and the clips take that stress which, off of the nails, which maintains a better, the shoe stays on a lot better and more securely. Hello, we are here today in Harriman, Tennessee at Painorama, and we are talking with Anya Danielson. Hey there. <laughs> hey baby, hey baby, and this is baby. <laughs> Anya, tell me, hon, how long have you been showing? Um, for two and a half years. Two and a half years, I see. Have you always ridden baby? No. No. I. I bought her in February, Okay. and last year I showed my horse Jet. Jet. Ah, do you still have Jet? No. No. Okay. Um, I understand that you travel a lot with these shows. Yes. Yeah. Um, tell me a little bit about what it's like to travel and try and keep up, keep up your grades, because I understand that you have to, to, you have to maintain an A average. Sometimes I bring my homework with me, and I do it on the car ride, in the car. I see. And I study like when I'm not busy when with the horses. When you're not busy, yeah. What's your favorite subject besides horses? Um, language arts. Language art. We have seen you in the halter classes. Do you also ride? Yes, okay. I show in Western. You show in Western, okay. Do you have what, brothers and sisters? I have one younger brother. One younger brother, okay. Are they pretty proud of you? Uh-huh. Uh-huh, <laughs> right. yeah. Okay. Excellent. Well, we are so happy that you could talk with us today, and we wish you the best today. Thank When's your you. next show? Um, we might be going to New Jersey next weekend. Uh, next weekend. So, do you think you would? Would you say that you're on the road at least every other week? Yes. I see. Fantastic. You did a great job on you. Thank you so much. Thank you. You too, baby. <laughs> Lisa DeFriends, a trainer with the Ringling Brothers Circus, talked with us about her work with zebras. Hi, Lisa. Nice to see you. Thank nice you for talking you. with us. Thank you for having me. What beautiful animals you have Thank here. you. Uh, mm -hmm. Can you tell me a little bit about where they came from? Mm -hmm. These are grant zebras, and they are the most common type of zebra that are trained, that uh -huh. you'll see in circuses and zoos and things like that. Right. And. Um, and I would surmise from that that they are the easiest of the zebra species yeah. to train. Yeah. These had come from different areas. One of them was raised in Kentucky and the others kind of, I don't exactly know where they came from. Okay. We got them all from a farm in Kentucky, but that wasn't all of their origination. Right, right. Mm -hmm. um, you, you also train horses. You have a long history of training, yes. training animals. Do you find that the zebras are any more difficult to train than horses? They're, I wouldn't say they're more difficult. I'd say they take a longer time and much more patience and more trying to figure out uh, techniques. I see. So th they remain wild animals. I mean, these, these yes. are not pets. No. Well, uh, one of them thinks she, he's a pet, 
but they are wild okay. and they always stay wild. Okay. They never lose that extremely, extremely high flight instinct. Right, very, very high. Very high. They yeah. never, I had a zebra, my first zebra I got when he was three months old, raised him. He came to Japan on a show with me and lived with my horses. Okay. The horses would always relax once they got into their stable right. area, eat right. their hay. People would come in and out during the show time, uh -huh. wouldn't bother them. The zebra yeah. always. Was him, Who's watching, there? Watching, always, yeah. always. So he, he never. Perhaps feels more of a prey animal than yes. than, 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 yes. Yes. than yes. for than sure. A horse. Mm -hmm. um, where can this these animals be seen in your, in your production? Well, these animals right now, we are we came here to Equitana. Yeah. They have never been anywhere. Oh. This is their first outing. Premier, premier yes. show. All they're, right. Actually, they're still in training. It was dubbed as a training demo. Uh, they will be in the new edition of Ringling Brothers Circus beginning in January of 2001. 2001. Yeah. Okay. They'll be with a new unit. They've been in tra I've, I've been with them since November of last year. Okay. And we thought, I have my horses here uh -huh. and we're performing in the main event. Right. So they heard about the zebras in training and they thought it would be a good idea sure, if we could bring sure. them here as a training demo. And I first were a little, a little hesitant. bit hesitant because I was here last year and I knew the people in the area commotion. and the commotion. Yes. And I thought, well, yes. you know, if they're willing to have us, we're willing to right. go for a great uh, yes. opportunity to yes. get them. And they have just kind of acclimated. Absolutely. Yeah, they have yeah. been just champs. I'm so proud of them. Well, They've they're really they're, a, been they're great. a beautiful animal and we are glad you're here and we thank your time. I know I know Thank you've you. got to get to the show. So good luck. Thank, <laughs> thank you. you very much. There was a time in our not so distant past when the entire world was moved by the power of horses. Their contribution to the foundation and the prosperity of this country can be seen in every chapter of our history. We no longer need them to plow, to carry us in battle, or move our goods. And yet we cannot or will not let go of their presence in our lives. We thank you so much for sharing this time with us. As always, when you are horsing around, be safe. Ha <laughs> ha